This morning's lesson, lesson 12, the cost of discipleship. Now, first off, what is discipleship? Uh, I looked online because, well, that's where I go. Discipleship is not a biblical word, so I couldn't find the original Greek or Hebrew, so I had to go find the definition of the modern term, just exactly the way it is in English. According to allaboutfollowingjesus.org, discipleship is teaching biblical precepts while modeling and guiding others toward living righteous, righteously as followers of Jesus Christ. This should be a cyclical process, meaning once we are discipled, we are to disciple others, and so on. I thought this was probably the best uh, definition I could find, so I just went with that one. That seems just exactly what I expected discipleship to be. A uh, disciple is one who learns, uh, one who learns from another. So to disciple is to teach others. Discipleship, once again, is not a biblical word, although disciple is. The main word translated as a disciple is found 268 times in the New Testament. Sounds like it must be a pretty important word. <laughs> and there are certainly words that are more often like the, but I think disciple has a little bit more importance in the, in the grand scheme of things in the, in the New Testament there. <clears throat> the, a disciple, once again, is a student, a pupil, or a learner, one who learns. To be a disciple of Jesus is not like being a student in a school or a university. In those cases, there will be eventually a cessation of learning on that level. Once a student graduates, he will likely continue to learn, but he will not be called a student anymore. Now, as we, as we've all been through school to, to some extent. We've all come out the other side of that. And that was not the end of our learning in this life. But how many here are still students even though you're no longer in school? None of us. We don't, you don't, you're not a student once you get out of school. You may learn, but you don't learn on the same level as you learned in school. When you're in school, it's, it's focused. All you're doing is learning. It's just completely about what you can absorb in the time that you have available in that class, in that grade, in that level, wherever it may be, whatever it may be that you're doing, even if it's just uh, uh, studying out a certain course, uh, uh, even a, an apprenticeship program where you're studying a, a particular thing. All of these things come to an end. The only graduation for disciples of Jesus is our entrance into eternity. If we, we must never cease to learn and grow in our understanding of God's word and his will for our lives. If we do, then we cease to be disciples. Disciple is a continual, to be a disciple is to continually learn, continually focus on that Understanding that we need to absorb all that we can of God's Word, all that we can from His Spirit, so that we can not only receive for ourselves, because when, when somebody goes to school, generally speaking, they're going for their own needs. Okay, well, I want to do this for myself. I want to do this because it'll, it'll be a good-paying job. I want to do this because this is, this is what, I, what I, I'm interested in. But when it comes to serving the Lord and learning from Him, our our benefits go far beyond ourselves. I want to know more about the Lord so that I can in turn be a benefit to others, so that I can help them to understand the importance of serving the Lord, so I can, under, I can help them to understand not only the importance, but the benefits, because there are benefits that go along with serving the Lord. Jesus told us that in this world ye shall have tribulation. Now, I, I love that verse, and I know I've said it many times, but I can't help it. He didn't say in this world, if you're in sin, you'll have tribulation. He didn't say in this world, if, if you're saved, you'll have tribulation. He said in this world, you'll have tribulation. It's going to happen. This, this was a promise, regardless of where we are, what we may be doing, who may, we may be around. We're going to have tribulation in this world. But then he said, be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. And by our di- allowing ourselves to be disciples of Christ, we can learn how to overcome the trials of this world, the struggles that everybody is guaranteed to face in this world if we put our trust in him, if we look to him for guidance and direction. This, this is a small part, this learning, this continual learning is a small part of our, the cost of discipleship. To this day, we still call those closest followers of Jesus his disciples. Well, they've been long dead, but we still call them disciples. There never came a day while they lived that they were able to rise above being his students. Jesus said in Luke 6 and 40, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. That is the goal of discipleship. To be like Jesus. We should all strive not only to be like Jesus, but to help others to do the same. And that is what discipleship is. Now there, into the lesson here, there is a cost in serving the Lord. Salvation itself is free because it is priceless. Now wait, what? Salvation is free? Because it's priceless? Now, I don't know about you, but I understand priceless to mean beyond value. It means that something is worth so much that it can't be replaced or purchased. So how can it be priceless and free as well? Well, salvation is priceless. The population of the world throughout history all together could never amass wealth enough to purchase a single soul. But God, in His mercy, knew all of this before He set time in motion. And He prepared a way for us to receive a gift that we could never hope to earn. Salvation is free because God has already paid the price. Jesus, God with us, came to earth and took on the form or the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't take on sinful flesh was the likeness of sinful flesh, because there was no sin in him. Not the sinfulness of the flesh, but just simply its shape and its appearance. Thereby, he allowed himself to experience mortality. He took the punishment that we deserved to snatch the power of sin and death from the enemy on our behalf. He did all of this because of his great love for his highest creation. This became his free gift to all who would seek to repay that impossible debt. Now, we could never pay the price for our own redemption, but living out the Christian life does cost something, and many times this cost is more than the average person is willing to pay. This cost includes, among other things, giving our time, our resources, our talents, our dreams, ambitions, and plans, and even our loved ones in submission to God and His will for our lives. This is a high cost. But Jesus said that if we do not forsake all that we have, we cannot be His disciples. Giving our all touches a live nerve in each individual, for it goes right to the root of human nature The subject of this quarter, self-will. We have a choice to make. Each and every one of us have a choice to make. If I offer to pay all the expenses of a child's higher education, there will be no benefit received if that student has no desire to continue his education beyond high school. Where's the benefit? There's no benefit. I've I've got the resources here to take care of this situation, to resolve this financial crisis in in this family. I'm offering it freely, but if that child has no desire for higher education, what good is my gift? What good is my offer of this free gift? If I offer to send someone on vacation to a faraway location, free of charge, and they have no desire to travel, then I can keep my money and they can stay at home. There's nothing, no benefit to the one who was offered this free gift. If the God of creation offers humanity an escape from the eternal torments of hell and we refuse His conditions, who are we to complain 
when we suffer for our own poor choices. This is the power that self-will still holds over humanity. We have to understand the importance of every choice that we make, but none more important than our decision to lay self-will at the foot of the cross and follow the one who is willing to pay the price for our failures. They were our mistakes. They were our sins. They were our shortcomings. And Jesus was willing to pay the price. Back to the lesson here. Until we are able to bring self-will under subjection to him, we will have a battle trying to be his disciples. Golden Truth, Luke 14.33 So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Lesson Exposition Part 1, Taking Up Your Cross. Luke 9 and 23, and he said it to them all. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I specifically love Luke's uh, passage here. Take up your cross daily. It's not just about, well, I, I, I went to the altar and I took up my cross then and now, I, now I'm good. I don't have to worry about it. But every day we need to remember why it is that we serve the Lord, what it is that we're doing, who it is that we serve, and how we should behave in every choice that we make, in every action that we take, every word that we speak. Luke 14 and 27, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. The cross is an instrument of death. It was made to serve no other purpose. Criminals were forced to carry their crosses to the place of execution when they were condemned to death. The symbolic meaning of a Christian taking up his cross in order to follow Christ means that he has denied self and has become completely obedient to the cause of Christ just as the criminal was forced to be completely surrendered to the torture, shame, and burden of carrying the thing which he was to die upon to the place of his death. Uh, one little difference here. Criminal is forced <laughs> to carry his cross. We take up our cross up. We take it up voluntarily. We recognize the importance of bearing this cross. We recognize the importance of, of what it stands for, of what it means to bear the cross. We don't, we're not forced. Jesus will not force anybody to the altar. The Holy Spirit will not drag anybody kicking and screaming to the altar for salvation. When we go, we go of our own accord. We go freely and by our own choice. <clears throat> Now, when I think of capital punishment, it still exists in this country, but the fact of the matter is it's, it's far less public than it has been in the past, than it once was. Carrying our own crosses is not like the executions of today. It's not hidden in a room far away, in a faraway place where only a few can see. To live for Christ and carry our crosses takes us back to the public executions of days gone by. Once again, we just read that the criminal had to carry his cross to the place of execution. And so it is with us. We bear this cross in our daily lives, in, in the words that we speak, once again, in our attitudes, in the way that we interact with others. We bear this cross wherever we are publicly. Once again, this isn't like a... <clears throat> Electric chair where nobody, just a very few people off to the side. See, this isn't like a, a lethal injection, once again, the same thing, and, and a gas chamber, all these things that we're familiar with in this day and age, uh, where they're separate. It, there are probably executions going on right now. We have no idea about it. The majority of the world has no idea. And I'm not talking about just here in the United States. I'm talking about everywhere. Because these things are not as public as that. But this, that, this cross that Jesus has called us to carry, it's a public execution, so to speak. We are executing God's will publicly. Now, that doesn't mean where everyone stands on the street corner and preaches and tells everybody they're going to hell. That's, that's not necessarily the public carrying of this cross that we're talking about. But we need to recognize that wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we have the potential 
to be a witness, to be an example. And God will place those opportunities in our path and we'll recognize them. We will recognize them if we're surrendered to him and we can utilize every opportunity that make, he makes available to be a blessing. Uh, Paul said, uh, pray that God would open the doors of utterance. What was he talking about? He was talking about making, make, make, a, 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 make a, available those opportunities to be a witness, to be an example. And I found myself praying that recently. Lord, open those doors of utterance for me. Give me the opportunity to be a blessing to somebody else. Show me when I have that opportunity and help me at all times to guard my tongue, to guard my life that, that nobody might have reason to speak evil of me. Because I represent Christ here on earth. I don't represent, when we, when we take up the cross, we no longer represent ourselves. Our lives from that point on represent Jesus. And our actions and our choices and the things that we say should also represent Jesus. To live for Christ and carry our crosses takes us back to the public, public executions of days gone by. This analogy was more than letting his disciples know that they would likely face difficulties. He was telling them that as they followed him, theirs would be a very public walk. This was made clear throughout his ministry, both in his words and his actions. And if we follow Christ, our walk will be public as well. I know that I've heard people in this church here say, someone came up to me and said, I, I can just tell that you're a Christian. I need you to pray for me. That's, that's where we need to be with the Lord. We need to have that, that attitude, that, that lifestyle where people don't have to question, well, where's he from? Where's she from? What's she talking about? How's she behaving? They just know simply because the Spirit who's living with us and guiding us and directing us in the choices that we make, the words that we say, all these things are critically important to our walk with the Lord. Those things that we overlooked in, in our past, we took for granted. Now we recognize the importance of every word that we speak and everything that we do. Because by, the, by our actions, we have the power to draw people to Christ and we have the power to push people away. I, I know my brother remembers the, the people who used to hang out at the mall with us and, and tell us all we were going to hell if we didn't, because we were, weren't living right. They were yelling at us. Nick, do you, do you remember that? Do you remember wanting to go to church with that guy? No, we didn't want to go to church with that guy. We wanted to get as far away from him as we could. We have to understand what it means to serve the Lord and be a light. He was darkness. He was shoving people away from the Lord. He was pushing people. He, he, his intentions were good. His motivations were confused. His his actions were very clearly pointing people in the other direction. We have to understand that our actions have the same potential. Our actions have the potential to push people away if we're not truly led by the Spirit. That's not what a disciple, that's not what discipleship is about. Discipleship is not about pushing people away from church, pushing people away from the Lord. It's about having that attitude that makes them think there's something different about this person. There's something different about this individual. What is it that makes this person the way they are and they say they're a Christian? All these other people, they say they're Christians, but that's not the way they act. They act, they act something completely different. So why is that? That gives them a desire to want to know more. We have to allow Christ, we have to allow the Spirit of God to use us to open those doors to others, to help others, to see the benefit, see the joy that can be found in the Lord, not the hatred and the anger and the, and the frustration and the, and the misery. There's enough of that in this world. There's enough of that going on all around us. But peace and joy in the Spirit can only be found through the love of Christ working through his disciples today. 
The lesson, as long as self-will is tugging on our hearts, there will be a half-hearted effort in following Christ. The first commandment of the ten says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This means that God must take first place in our lives. Putting self ahead of God makes us guilty of breaking the first commandment in principle. Now, the lesson says God must take first place in our lives. I, I don't know about that because Jesus made it clear that, that breaking the law is more than simply disobeying the literal words. He said that lust is the same as adultery and, and, and hatred is the same as murder. I don't think that Jesus used these two as the only laws that had extended meanings. I believe that everything in the Word of God has an extension to what it is. We have to understand the spirit of the direction that God gives us. I fully believe that that these were simply examples and all the laws of God can be broken while keeping those thoughts safely tucked away within our minds out of the sight of those around us. Jesus wanted us to know that we are to obey the spirit of the law and not only the letter. He also wanted us to know that nothing's hidden from God. We can, we can say, well, I didn't, I didn't punch him in the nose. I sure wanted to, but I didn't punch him in the nose. Well, according to what Jesus said, you punched him in the nose anyway. You may not have physically done it, but that thought, oh, you already did it. You're guilty. Jesus came to fulfill the law. The law principle is obeyed when we deny ourselves and take up our crosses and follow him. If we're not willing to do this, we cannot be his disciples. Part 2, Forsaking All, Luke 14 and 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Mark 10, 28 through 30. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake, and the Gospels, excuse me. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. When we come to the Lord, we must get our priorities in order. God always comes first. Many want to serve God, but cannot cut themselves loose from the entanglements of this life. Even our family members and loved ones must be relegated to second place in deference to God if we truly serve Him as He desires us to. Now, the word hate above does not mean a, a literal dislike, but rather it shows order of preference between one's family and God. Now, when God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, now, He wasn't talking about an order of importance. He wasn't talking about the word before in this situation means in his presence. It doesn't mean ahead, not ahead of him in priority. If the children of Israel had always served God first before they went to their pagan temples, would that have been acceptable to God? No, I don't think so. Then neither should we think, of, think ourselves safe if we allow anything in our lives to keep us from fulfilling, fulfilling God's will in all things and at all times as we should. <coughs> this, is where the fam this is where the family and the hate Jesus spoke of come into play. If even our loved ones would hinder us from, faithful, from our faithful service to God, then it is our responsibility to separate ourselves from them and not allow their interference to hinder us spiritually. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about hating our families. He's talking about separating ourselves from them if they're causing a disruption in our service to the Lord. If, if my wife is causing me to keep from coming to church, then I need to come to church anyway. I, regardless, as important as my relationship with Wendy is, my relationship with God is far more important. 
The relationship I have with Wendy only lasts as long as this life. And it's over. It's till death do us part. But the relationship I have with God, that's eternal. The relationship I have with my family, the relationship I have with my friends, they'll come and go. But my relationship with God is eternal. I cannot allow any relationship in this life to stand between me and my service to the Lord. If I do, then my family, my friends have become a God that are hindering me from my full service to the Lord if they're drawing me away from God's will. Now, that's not saying that we can't be witnesses. That's saying if there's nothing else you can do but separate yourself from the situation. Separate yourself from the situation. If it's going to hinder you from serving the Lord, uh, it wasn't too long after I started attending church that my father began speaking to me again. He hadn't spoken to me in probably six or eight years. I don't know. He just called me out of the blue. And called me up. We had a good talk. And it was quite enjoyable. We started emailing each other back and forth every single day. And, and I, like I said, I just started going to church, and I was doing my best to convince him of his need to get out of what he was in and, and move in a better direction. And pretty much he just did the same thing for me. He told me I was in the wrong way, and I needed to get out of this situation to get in a better direction. And that went on for months, every single day. I, I found myself, I was, I was probably at, at the peak, I was spending probably three hours a day typing email to my father. And finally, it, it came to the point where in my new relationship with God, it was actually wearing on me and, and hindering my spiritual growth. And, and I told him, I said, I can't do this anymore. If, if, you can, if you can talk to me and not say anything about your religion, I'll talk to you and not say anything about my religion. But until then, I, I've, got, I've got to cut this off. I can't do this anymore. I can't. And once again, I didn't, I didn't hear from him for a long time. But that was important for my spiritual growth. I praise the Lord that God allowed us to renew our relationship and we got to hang out some before he passed away. But that was important for my spiritual growth. I was dying spiritually. I was putting out more than I could get in. I was, I was giving more away than I could receive. I, I wasn't getting anything back from the Lord. I was putting everything into this relationship trying to convince my father of what he needed to do. And I, I was not capable. I couldn't do it. And it was wearing on me. It was hurting me. It was hindering me. So much so that I had to cut that relationship off. I had to stop it. It's not that I hated my father. It's not that I didn't want anything to do with him. On the contrary, I, I missed my father at that point because I wanted to have that time with him because I really never got to have a, a, a good relationship with my father, not because he was bad. He just wasn't there. We, uh, my, our parents divorced when, when we were young, and, and I, well, for the most part, we didn't get to see our dad a lot. And that's something that I missed. I really wanted that relationship. But because of the hindrance that it was to my spiritual growth at my, in my early, early time of serving the Lord, because I'd grown up in church, but I wasn't serving him like I should, I, it was more than I could bear. And I had to cut off that relationship. And once again, I, I didn't hate my dad. I loved him. I wanted that relationship. But I understood that my relationship with God was more important. And I had to focus on that right then. I had to, to get the growth and the strength that I needed to become what God would have me to be. I, I recognized God made it clear that I wasn't going to fix him. <laughs> there wasn't anything I could do to change him. but I had to work on myself. And I still have to, I have to keep, that rec keep that recognition open in every relationship. I can't allow anybody on this earth to keep me from doing what I know that I need to do in my service to the Lord. When Jesus called 
his disciples, they immediately left what they were doing in order to obey his call. Some left fishing boats, others left government jobs, but they all left family to be with him. Peter began to confirm this to the Lord, and his response was that they would be blessed greatly for their obedient sacrifice, both in this life and the one to come. It seems as though they had no regrets in leaving all to follow Christ. For each and every one of us, it will be different, but all who choose to follow Christ will leave something behind, some things behind. Now, I'm sure that we all remember what, what the first thing that we had to let go when we began our walk with God. We may remember what that was, but as we continued on, other things may have begun to hinder us, and we began to recognize those things. If we are determined to be faithful, all such things will fall by the wayside as we continue our walk with the Lord. Otherwise, we may have lost sight of what was important and allowed the enemy to guide us down the exit ramp away from God's will. But here we are today, so we must have found our way back somehow if we did stray. Paul looked at all he had before Jesus showed him the truth, and he counted it as dung. All the benefit, all the education, all the learning. Uh, apparently he was a relatively wealthy man. All of his wealth, all of these things, he said, I count it but dumb. Now, I don't know about you, but me, I, I kind of try to stay away from dumb. If I accidentally step in it, I don't go looking for more, but I try my best as quickly as I can to separate myself from its stench as quickly and thoroughly as possible. If God has His perfect way in us, we will see those things that we once chose over God in that same light. We won't have that desire to, to be a part of them. We won't go back looking for more. We'll do our best to separate from ourselves from them because we'll recognize that stench, that same stench that Paul recognized when he says, I count them but dung. If we do recognize them, we will not be able to separate ourselves quickly enough from their presence. Let me go ahead and jump down to part three here. The love of life. Luke 9 and 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, once again, words, love words, reasonable. What is that word reasonable in the Bible? The original Greek, I believe, is logikos. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> it's actually the Greek word from which we get the English word logic. <clears throat> it means, according to reason, or rationalization. God is holy, and he states throughout the Bible that we are called to be holy as well. When a sacrifice was made under the Old Testament, there was no part of the animal that was allowed to continue on. The entire animal was dedicated to God's use. It would not be accepted as a sacrifice if his horns were donated to the pagan temple down the road. But the rest of them was used for God. <clears throat> The sacrifice would have been unacceptable if the one who brought it said, here's my sacrifice, but his fleece is really pretty, so I want to keep that when we're done. Is that okay? No, not okay. Everything was completely dedicated to God. What, what, makes, us, what makes us think that it should be any different when we are called to be living sacrifices whom God has called us to be? This is the sum total of discipleship, everything that we have, when we surrender everything that we have to God, holding no part back for ourselves, then God can use us not only to be disciples, not only can we learn, but we can disciple others. We can help others to understand the benefits. We can show others the way to go in order to be a blessing to those around them and disciple others in, in return. 
We've been asked to present our bodies as living holy and holy sacrifices in service to God. This presupposes the yielding of our hearts also since the body is subject to the directions from the heart. When we fail to yield to God's will, we are saving our lives for ourselves. When we do this, we lose our lives in the long run. If we yield our lives in willing obedience service to God, we are losing our lives to ourselves for His sake. The result of this commitment is being saved at the end of the way. Excuse me. Since human nature is what it is and our own wills are stubbornly, stubbornly resistant to God's will by nature, many do not know the blessedness and peace that comes to one who is totally resigned to Christ. This word peace stood out to me. Peace is a very important word here. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now the phrase, not as the world giveth. Now does anybody in this world, anybody here, know what the world's definition of peace is? What's the world's definition of peace? It's, it's, it's the absence of turmoil. It's the absence of strife. It's the absence of difficulty. That's not the peace that God gives us. That's not the peace that Jesus has supplied to us. The peace that Jesus gives us is being able to relax in the knowledge that His peace, that He can give us peace in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of struggle. When the world is, is striving and, and fighting all around us, we can still be calm. We can still have peace in the knowledge that we're serving the Lord as we should. And we can, we can enjoy our lives even in the difficult times. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't have trouble. Once again, we, we already mentioned earlier, Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. He assured us that we would have trouble, but we also have the assurance, if we're serving Him, we have the assurance of peace to take us through every storm of life. Once again, the peace that Jesus gives us is joy in the midst of suffering. It's happiness in the midst of despair. It's something that this world can't do. We think that the only time we can be happy is when everything's going our way. But Paul made it clear that you can be happy when you're in jail. <laughs> and, and the jail cell that Paul was sitting in is not like the jail cell of today where you got the internet and the your modern conveniences, toilet and running water and stuff. Jail cell he was sitting in probably had straw on the floor and all the mess from all the other people who'd been in there for years before and rats and, and if they got any food, it was probably dumped on top of the mess and like on top of that. Doesn't sound like a pleasant place to be. But he was able to rejoice because he knew where his peace came from. And if he could rejoice in prison... Who's suffering so much that they could say their life right now is, is that bad? If he could rejoice and sing praises to God in the midst of that, what do we have to complain about? What are the worst of us in, in, as far as what we're suffering? What are the worst situations of, that we are having to face? How can, how can we complain? Let's skip down to the bottom here. Let's see. Often it takes much time, depending on the individual's willingness to become abandoned to Christ, we must become crucified to self in all areas of our lives. We must become dead to our dreams, our affections, our culture, dead to comforts or annoyances, to our plans, to our troubles, to praise or blame, to success or failure, to our personal preferences, and the list can go on and on. Paul said, once again, this is what I was talking about just a second ago, Philippians 4, 11 and 12, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. 
I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere. In all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. When we are settled fully in the love of God, our circumstances cannot dictate our state of mind. Our circumstances cannot dictate our state of mind when we're fully surrendered to the Lord because we can have peace. When this world looks on, uh, I think we can ha- rather we can have peace in the knowledge that all things are working together for God's will and our own good. I think about a time back, I know I've mentioned it before, Wendy and I were dealing with the, the pharmacy for my Aunt Maisine. She was sick and had to go pick up her medicine. And we had to go back, I don't know how many times. And, and it was a computer glitch. It was some kind of insurance mess up. They could not give us the medicine that Maisine needed. So we'll come back and we'll see if we can get it worked out. Came back. Still messed up. Had to go away again. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm doing everything I can. And come back and it was still messed up. Come back. Still messed up. Finally, the, I don't know, the fourth or fifth time we're going through the drive through I'm just sitting there with a smile on my face. Why are you smiling? What, what's, what is it that's making you smile? I said, was getting mad going to fix anything? I didn't even say the word Jesus. But the attitude that I had was a, was a benefit to him. It was a blessing to him because he was so frustrated. And he knew that I was just going to yell and cuss him out the next time I pulled up that window. And I just smiled because I knew it was out of his control. He wasn't trying to be mean. He wasn't trying to make my life difficult. He was suffering probably more than I was. He needed a smile. He needed some peace in the midst of that storm. And I had a little. And I was willing to share it. That's not boasting on me. There's nothing good in me but the love of God. But that's what God has called us to be. That's what God has called us to do. That's that's part of this discipleship. Once again, I didn't have to say the word Jesus. I just had to have the attitude of Christ in that situation. And it made him want to know more. There's so much more that God has for each and every one of us. But all we have to do is surrender ourselves fully. And if we think we've surrendered ourselves fully... Chances are good. There's more that we can let go. There's more that we can, there's, there's a closer walk that each and every one of us can have with the Lord. So I, thinking about what Sister Crystal said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. All things are possible to him that believe. That's what Jesus replied. All things are possible. And what that tells me is we're not where we need to be. Because if we were, those all things that would be possible would be going on around us. All those who come up and request prayer for their bodies would be walking away healed. Laura wouldn't be sitting back there blind. She'd be rejoicing and praising the Lord because she sees. But because we're not where we need to be, we're not fully surrendered, these things aren't happening. It's up to us. I can't fix any of you guys. (laughs) I can't change anybody but myself. But it's our responsibility as individuals to recognize where we're coming short and step up just a little closer. And everyone who does that, every, every day that we do that, we get a little closer to God, we'll see more of Him working in us. We've, we probably, most of us, experienced that peace that I was talking about in the midst of str- struggle, in the midst of turmoil. But how many other times have we suffered because we forgot to look to the one who's in control of the storm. Let's be the disciples God would have us to be. Let's pay whatever cost, whatever it takes, whatever we have to let go, whatever we have to accept. It it will be worth it in the end, not only for our own soul's sake, but for the the sake of those souls whom we're able to reach out to by, by the good attitudes that we can have, by the Spirit of God working in us. God has been so good to us. Let's let's share what he's given us with others. <clears throat>